Okay, so, um, as I said, I was kind of interested, um, I'd done a lot of work in surface engineering, I was looking for uh, applications in biology, thinking, oh, there must be some, some creatures which care about surface engineering and not, you know, not realizing that the great bulk of creatures, of living creatures are insects. It was sort of a stupid question. I wonder that I took so long to figure it out. But uh, then I, if, the, if you're interested in learning about uh, applications of fluid mechanics or physics in general in uh, biology, then there's a wonderful series of books by Stephen Vogel and, and Mark Denny. Uh, Steve Vogel is the place to start. He has books called um, Life's Devices is one. Uh, Basically, the, if you read the books, it reads like these are problems in biology that biologists can't solve because we don't know enough math and we don't know enough physics, right? And so it's a really an invitation for people with a stronger math physics background to get involved. And he, all of these books, they have one chapter on surface tension where they basically say, we don't understand this, we don't understand this. And I'd sort of look at them and say, oh, I think I can do that problem. Let's have a go at this. And a lot of people, applied mathematicians, have been doing this. So. I know Mike Shelley at the Courant, they had something about, so it turns out that in, in, uh, in the wind, leaves bend in response to the wind, and this decreases the drag on the tree, because if they didn't bend, then you'd get this huge force which would uproot the tree. So it's in the tree's best interest if its leaves bend in response to wind. So Mike, that inspired some a very nice work by Mike. But in general, these, I think uh, a lot of this work came out of reading the one, the single chapter that they had on uh, surface tension in biology. So uh, we've already argued that surface tension is important relative to gravity when things are small, small relative to raindrops. So this is basically important on a sc the scale of insects. And the bonus of all of this is that now we have this burgeoning field of microfluidics where people are making micro pumps and uh, for drug delivery and various other uh, <clears throat> applications, many of them are medical, and exactly the same problems come. So we're basically trying to figure out how to move around small volumes of fluid, uh, uh, and of course, nature has already figured this out. We have creatures which operate on that scale. How do they do it? Where there's clearly much to learn okay? from nature. Okay, and so here's a, this is a not such a small creature, but here's one which actually evidently knows how to use surface tension. It is a baby beluga um, blowing a toroidal uh, bubble. I like the response of the animal. It clearly knows what it's doing. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll come to Troy Bowles. And so here's a bug. So this is more classic uh, biomimetic. So these guys um, <clears throat> walk along uh, rigid surfaces with great ease, but if they want to, they can lock down, right? So if a predator comes around, they can generate these huge forces which keep them from being lifted off because they have a soft underbelly. So ants in particular eat these things, so they try and flip them over and attack their underbelly. But these guys, if they want to, can support huge forces, right? So, and they basically use this capillary adhesion which relies specifically on surface tension. This photograph is for real. Yeah, it's real, it's real, yeah. yeah it's a good, I like the photo. So, uh, and, and here, here's, we were just talking about surfactants. Here's a natural example of a surfactant. So this guy, this is basically a, a bug walking on water. We just put this stuff, this is just powder we put on the surface so we can see what's happening. But it basically releases a chemical. The surface tension, this uh, chemical reduces the surface tension so then it's sitting on the surface in a surface tension gradient so it gets pulled in the direction of the higher surface tension. So these bugs actually use this as an emergency escape uh, uh, <clears throat> mechanism. Okay, and, and now, uh, so if we now look at water walking creatures, so these things are about a centimeter long. Why is it that we don't see goats or donkeys walking across water? What is the largest creature that can walk on water? What, how, do we, how do we rationalize this? Again, I'm supposed to be asking um, questions rather than telling answers. So why are females bigger than males? Um, so how, how, and how do these creatures, as we'll see, these creatures are uh, water repellent, so they, the, both the surface chemistry and texture is such that uh, water doesn't impregnate into their, into their uh, surface, 
uh, and so they can stay on the, because these things are actually uh, slightly heavier than water, so if they get wet, they will sink to the bottom, but because of their water repellent coat, they don't, okay? So, but if you have a water repellent coat, how do you actually generate thrust? So how do those water striders do it? How do these uh, spiders do it? So they're basically exploiting surface tension for propulsion. So here they're jumping off the free surface. How high can they jump? Can we rationalize this? Is, is it different from the height they can jump to off dry land or is it the same? <coughs> this is just, a, I like this video because it's a combat video. It's two, two males fighting for the affection of this female. And they're actually nasty beasts. They, try, they jump and they try and rip e break each other's legs. <laughs> so uh, this guy wins. Good celebration at the end. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so, but they, so they actually uh, are born underwater in eggs, and then they, they have to, the infant wa water striders have to swim up to the surface and break through, and they spend their entire life on the surface until uh, the, the female has to submerge to lay eggs. And so the question is, how do they, and these, as you can see there, it looks kind of hard. She's having to do quite hard work, and to cross the interface, you have to generate a force which is 100 times greater than your weight. So it's actually an enormous force, right, on this scale. And so how do they do it? And again, it's, they actually change the chemistry. So it's a question of using uh, surfactants. Okay. okay, and so <coughs> interfacial flotation, we all know that copper is heavier than water. But if you have a small chunk, then the interfacial force generated along its edge is sufficient to, to bear its weight. Okay, and so if we put down now, this you can see from the distortion of the grid on the bottom, you can see the, get an indicator of the deflection on the surface. If we put down several of these things, they're going to uh, attract. So why is that? How can we rationalize that? How can we describe the force acting between these floating objects? And for that matter, who cares about such objects? Well, if whenever you ask a question uh, about uh, physics, there's always some creature that cares about it. So any mechanism that you can imagine could be of some use to some creature, it will be. The mines are at the bottom of the container? That's right. So basically, where in regions where they're greatly distorted, it means there's a large deflection of the interface. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, that's right. That's right. OK, and so, so who cares about these things? Well, these bugs do, because this is how they attract their mates. They basically uh, distort the interface in order to generate these capillary attractive forces. And then if they decide that it's not a love connection, then they try and uh, separate. Um, <laughs> they try and <laughs> escape. And there, a surface tension was not enough to bind them together. Uh, OK. And uh, so, this, so they also use, these guys use surface tension to generate propulsive forces. So here's a, a meniscus. Uh, adjoining uh, a wall, and these guys basically by arching their backs generate uh, capillary forces which propel them upwards. Okay? So these... Uh, yeah. And they have to be... So a lot of bugs, they, they live on the interface, but sometimes they have to be able to escape to land, so to avoid predators or to lay eggs. So sometimes they have to go from the water to the land, and this is the way that some of them do it. They, so they've actually learned to change their body shape, so again, it changes the surface area, and if there's a gradient, uh, sorry, it changes the surface energy, and if there's a gradient in surface energy, then there's an associated force which drives it. Uh, they go really quickly. Yeah. Yeah, so it arches the back and, yeah, 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 it does. Okay, so here's one. So this is a <coughs> my grad student. So this is these are all our videos. But the, he said it's propelling itself on a flat surface. I still don't know if it's. I think there must be some law against this. So I decided ultimately there must have been wind currents or something. But this one does seem to be drifting without moving. But it must violate some very basic tenet of physics. So um, we decided that that was a hoax. Uh, and so now these beetles actually, um, 
as they move, they generate waves, capillary waves. Uh, we know that, so I'll get into the distinction between capillary, capillary waves and gravity waves. Basically, waves which are small. Uh, if, if waves are large, then we uh, know that there's a balance between inertia and gravity. So it's gravity which is acting to flatten them out. But if, it's, if the waves are very small, then it's surface tension. Surface tension also wants to minimize the surface energy, so keep things flat. So uh, an, a small object uh, will generate capillary waves, and these whirligig beetles move around at high speeds generating these waves, and they actually use them for echolocation. So just like bats use uh, sonar to find their prey and avoid uh, obstacles, these guys do the same. So they basically generate capillary, uh, capillary waves and so feel, uh, find their prey and find their way around the surface. Yeah. Yeah, my arrow is strangely out of position there, but yeah, yeah. Okay, and so, so uh, how is water repellency achieved by plants? If any of you have ever seen a, a water draw, a raindrop on a lotus leaf, it rolls around with great ease. And this is the sort of guiding light in the development. So similarly, if you look closely at these water walking bugs, uh, you see that there's, uh, there, there's a thin layer of air and the, it, which the water never actually penetrates the surface coating of the structure. And, and this is exactly why they don't fall through the interface. And so, in fact, so the natural designs for water repellent surfaces as used in plants and bugs form the basis of uh, man-made water repellent surfaces as they use. So, for example, Gore-Tex and Teflon, these, all, these are all, uh, they have a surface texture and surface uh, chemistry which is similar in spirit to those of these. So this is, a, this is a, a really a classic example of the success of biomimicry. So, uh, and because now of uh, advances in, in microfabrication, so we can make things on a very small scale. This is why we're now able to create these super hydrophobic surfaces. Sorry? So what's the term called? Biomimicry? Biomimicry. So biomimicry is mimicking uh, biology, right? And so for example, they, they now have self-cleaning windows. So windows uh, they have texture on a very small scale, so small that it doesn't affect the light passing through. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, so then you have this super hydrophobic window. So if dust accumulates on it, then when the rain hits, the rain just rolls off and it collects all the dust. So it's basically being cleaned by the rain. Okay, and so, and, and bio, nature uses this uh, water repellency in all sorts of interesting ways. So we accidentally caught these bugs in the lab um, and noticed that so this one was swimming under the surface. And uh, it basically, it's so water repellent that uh, when it's underwater, it maintains an air layer on the surface because the water does not want to come into contact with the surface. So it maintains a thin air layer, which is called a plastron. And, uh, oxygen diffuses from the water into this plastron and so it's constantly being replenished the oxygen in this thin air layer so it stays underwater indefinitely so they're underwater breathing and so we would that sort of raised an interesting question physics question and so we went and looked at how they actually do this so we looked at the mechanics of it and you can ask how deep can they go in the water column as a function of their metabolic rate and it turns out these bugs uh, when they're uh, uh, when they're hibernating, they basically go into a, a static state in, in the winter and they go to a certain uh, level uh, in the water column which is different from that in which they're moving around a lot because they need more oxygen. So basically the depth, you can sort of rationalize their depth in the water column. But it's, again, they're very ingenious uh, mechanisms which are exploited in uh, nature. And you can, ask, so you can ask the same thing, well why can't humans do this? how big a diving chamber would we need to survive underwater? And it's actually not that big. It's five meter diameter if you have a chamber which has super hydrophobic surface, right? So basically you just go down in this dome. Uh, the area, by the way, that's about the same as the air of your lungs, which is enormous. But, uh, so then you'd have a thin layer of air on the surface of this uh, hydrophobic diving uh, chamber and oxygen would diffuse into it enough oxygen to keep you alive. Um, the, the problem is, in, uh, in doing this, for humans, is you have to keep the surface hydrophobic. You have to keep it water repellent, which means keeping it clean. Otherwise, you have defects and water will rush in and you'll suffocate. And so this is why these insects uh, are always grooming, okay? 
So they, in order to maintain this layer, they're constantly you know, getting their hair straight and getting rid of the junk. So, uh, but it's this which allows them to survive underwater. It's not just vanity. Okay, and so other peculiar mechanisms in nature. Uh, <clears throat> this is a Namib desert beetle. So it lives in a desert where it never rains, but it needs to drink regularly. And so what it does is it climbs up to the top of the sand dune, and there are uh, sea breezes that blow in, and these have very small droplets, which are sort of micron scale. Um, and they have on their surface, uh, uh, on their backs, they have texture, and they, you see these bumps. The bumps are hydrophilic, that is to say they like water, and the valleys are hydrophobic. So they, the water wants to be on the bumps, but not the valleys. So the, the raindrops accumulate on the bumps until getting large enough. So then they grow by accretion. The other drops hit them, and they grow and grow and grow until they get large enough that they roll into the hydrophobic valleys, and then they basically play this game where they move the drop up towards their mouth, and then they drink it. So, so it's, an, it's, a, it's actually an example of a chemical condenser, because normally we think of, uh, we, conde we, we condense water through refrigeration, right? We basically cool a surface, and this uh, uh, brings the water out of the moist air, but here they're actually doing it chemically. And so this has been used, this is used now for harvesting water in the third world. Right? This, these using surfaces called superplastics. They were actually developed at MIT, and it's, again, a matter of texturing the surface chemistry. Okay, and so here's another, so this is a, I have a student working on natural drinking strategies and basically all of them, these clever devices all involve surface engines. So this is a lizard drinking from this uh, um, body of water. So it simply sticks its leg in and it uses capillary suction to, to uh, uh, drink. And it basically, it has a pump in its mouth which, and it, which it, it uh, so it can, once it's saturated, it can then drain the water out of its body. But it's a very uh, subtle mechanism. We're sort of getting at it now. But it's basically using capillary action to, to drink. OK, and so here's a, a, another, an example of a bird which knows a great deal of fluid dynamics. It basically swims in a, in a circle and generates a vortex. And these vortices, this vortex sweeps its prey up. It's prey of these little bugs. And so it then goes like this with its beak, and it grabs a drop of water, and this drop of water has its prey in it. And then it does this, and the drop moves up towards its mouth, um, and then it consumes its prey and spits the water out. So it's a very uh, subtle um, mechanism, which requires, uh, I'd say, a greater uh, knowledge of, of surface tension than most biologists have. So this was. Um, Got into that, and here's an example I'll also be talking about in the class is a capillary origami. So here we can have the deformation of soft solids uh, through interfacial effects. So if we have this is an elastic sheet, we put a drop on it, and these interfacial forces we think of there being a tensile force per unit length tangent to the surface. These cause uh, these soft solids to close, and so this is work done by my friends in, in Paris. So as soon as I saw it, I said, ah, there must be something in nature which uses this, right? Because any mechanism that you can find in the lab is being exploited in nature somewhere. You just have to find out where. OK, so here's, here's their video. Uh, we've put a drop on. The drop evaporates. So this uh, sheet closes, but you can generate all sorts of interesting shapes. And so these are, so these are three examples of which we, I found in nature. Uh, so this is a floating flower. This is the, di uh, the uh, spider web. And I'll, we'll look at the dynamics of that. And then uh, this is the tumming, hummingbird's tongue. So these are all examples uh, of uh, natural systems where the interaction between interfacial forces and soft solids uh, gives rise to interesting dynamics. So, so you can ask, so the, how does the folding flower work? So there are flowers that live in ponds. And when there are when they're floods, the water level comes up, and, but they want to protect their genetic material. Their genetic material are in there, so they close in response to the rising water. Um, and then if the, when the flood recedes, so when the water level comes back down, they open up again, uh, having survived the ordeal. Right? So it's, again, relying on this flexibility of the solid um, and the interfacial forces for survival. 
And so we turn this upside down and you can ask, can we grab water with this same technique? And there's no reason not to. So we now put this flower down here, we pull it up, you then get hydrostatic suction, causes the thing to close. Surface tension keeps the, air, the fluid from leaking out and so you can grab uh, fluid. Uh, and this is a sort of couple of uh, centimeters in scale. And so this is actually, so some of these techniques, so this is one example of uh, something which has come out of our lab that they're using in um, this guy here, Jose Andres, who's a top Spanish chef in the States. He uh, worked with El Bulli, uh, the guy, Ferran, that's Ferran Adria, who's the had El Bulli, which is the number one restaurant in the world, uh, two years in a row. Uh, but he's the sort of American wing of it, and he's using this in his restaurant. So they have these ridiculous cor uh, meals where you have 30 courses or something, right? And so sometimes between course number 21 and 22, they want to have something small just to clear the palate. So they serve liqueur, uh, a very fine liqueur, and he's, he, he's serving it with this uh, little, so he's made these flowers out of elast plastic sheets, actually edible gels. And so he then, you basically serve yourself like this, the liqueur, and then you eat the gel at the end. So, uh, but there, there's another, a couple of things that have come out of my lab that he's using in his restaurants now. Is there some scale for them to work? Yeah, yeah, there is. It, it's actually, uh, typically you say surface tension is important on a millimetric scale, but when you get the solid involved as well, you can actually g go much larger. So we have, these flowers are sort of that big. Okay, uh, right. <clears throat> Little break, two minute break, three minute break, thanks. Very good. Andre can go get it.